Guys, the three main type of bearings that we're going to deal with in our motorcycle and ATV engines are these three right here. So we have a ball bearing, and then we have a needle bearing, and then we have a roller bearing. So to just to quickly identify which type of bearing we have, this has the centrifugal balls in here. This is the inner race. This is the cage that houses the balls a certain space apart from each other. And then this is the outer race. So it's going to be important that we know the inner and outer race because on different types of bearings we need to know where to pull on that bearing to remove it from a shaft or from a case or whatnot. If we are going around a shaft like this, my, my, my thought is, is that if I have to pull a bearing, take, uh, replace it. Okay, because what happens is, these are an interference fit. That means this is smaller than the shaft that it's going on. Make sense? And when I take a pull on this to get it, or excuse me, if I pull on the outside of this, so I pull on this to get it off the shaft, what does that do to the balls in the inner race? Yeah, stresses Puts indentations and it stresses it. If I have a way to go in here and press on the inner race, it doesn't hurt the bearing at all. Because you're pushing this, this, the outer race and balls don't get any stress because the fitment is the inner race to the shaft. But like if you look at this case, do you see how where there's just next to no room? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so what's happened, for me to get the bearing off of this shaft, I'm going to have to grab onto the meaty part of this and I will damage it. Okay, so this would be a, a replacement example here. Um, so if I'm putting this bearing into a case though, and I just have a shaft that's going to be able to slide in and out of here. Have you guys noticed how our transmission shafts were able to pull right out that they aren't an interference fit? Mm -hmm. You guys took your whole gear set and just pulled it right out. But this is pressed or interfit into the case. That means this race is larger than the case that it's being slid into. In that case, we would want to try and come from the backside and push on the outer race and drive it out if we wanted to reuse that bearing. So like in the case of a crank, uh, a crankshaft bearing or so on. Nine times out of 10, like I said, we're gonna go ahead and replace them. So by its design, this is a ball bearing, pretty easy to see. Let's switch to a needle bearing. Now if you look at, uh, and this is a roller bearing, if you look, they're similar in the fact that they have a caged housing that holds the, the part that's gonna roll, right? The steel piece that's gonna roll in either one of these. It, real simply to identify the difference, needle bearings are thin and they might all be stacked together. Does anybody know of a place where you have this type of bearing except there's no space and all the needles are together? U joints. Yeah. Um, connecting rod. Whoever cleaned the RC51 parts last week saw a bunch of these. Oh, and the swinger. In suspension components. It's really common suspension components, they just stack all these together with no cage, just like a needle bearing and then they uh, just pack it full of grease. Works really oh, well, yeah. okay? Now, a roller bearing, you'll notice, has a thick, beefy roller, if you will, housed in a cage. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna take a look at a bearing manufacturer, and these are typically found on crankshafts, on uh, wheels. This is a real common place that we find them uh, to support wheels and axles. So. Uh, a ball bearing like this is really good at holding what we call an axial load. Okay, does that make sense? That's how I remember it is axial and use part of that word for axle. So that means if I'm going to have a shaft going across here and I want to support, you know, both sides of this for rolling, that's an axle load. That means I'm going to have forces that are down and, and forward against the bearing and we can get really, really good and long life out, out of it. Needle bearings here. A lot of times what you'll notice is they're on a type of part that rotates up and down. Okay, so like this on the connect, this is the top one of a connecting rod of a two-stroke. This is where the piston pin goes through to support the piston. So we've got this up and down motion like this, right? So think about suspension components. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have that. We have U-joints that are basically rolling and turning around themselves. So that's where a needle bearing would be uh, really good. Now, roller bearings... I, I do see on camshafts, I do see on uh, Harley-Davidson, matter of fact, on their twin cam, did a roller bearing on one camshaft and a ball bearing on the other because through their R&D or engineering, the loads were more of a lateral load, okay, or an up and down. Another thing that, uh, the two terms that we talk a lot when it comes to bearings 
are axial load and lateral load. So here's the way I remember it. Axial load, I remember, is, is a shaft, is an axle, right? Lateral, I, 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 this is just me, I remember it as referring to being lazy. Okay, so that means side to side. Does that make sense? Lateral or being lazy. That's, that's the way I do it. I don't know if that's such a great, but it works for me. Okay, um, You guys might come up with something that's better for yourself. Um, the reality is, in all of my years of being a mechanic, 20 years of doing this, I have never, I have, excuse me, I've only seen you ever have an opportunity to change a bearing to a different type, and that's one time. And that's on Harley-Davidson on those twin cams where they had a bearing like this. The companies were switching it to a pair of to a pair of these of those two camshafts. You remember that on the twin cam? That's the only time ever in my entire career I've seen where you could alter a, a bearing between a roller or a ball bearing. One of the bearings I'm missing to demonstrate from is called a, uh, a Timken bearing. And basically, it's one half of this. So you're just going to have one half of this that sets in a race. And those are commonly found on your steering stem or where your handlebars attach on your motorcycle on modern bikes. On the old bikes, what you had was you had a lower race and an upper race, and all of the ball bearings are loose. Mopeds are really common for this. Smaller motorcycles are common for this. And when you take the handlebars off, where do you think all those balls go? They just go flying. And, and here's the thing. It's not just mopeds. I mean, bikes throughout the 80s used loose, uncaged ball bearings. Uh, to support their steering stem bearings, steering uh, the handlebars are the triple trees. Does everybody know what part of the motorcycle I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. With, uh, with that in mind, that is another area that it's real common. This is a company that's all balls that's really famous for making kits to convert those loose, uncaged ball bearings to a caged uh, bearing, something like this. But just the one half, so now we have a caged assembly, and you'll set that on there. I will find a Timken bearing and get it back in this box that I've been saving to, to show the different kinds. But you guys will see that uh, in the lecture in the classroom today. Robert? Is there one on the steering stem of the, the RC-51? No, the RC-51, believe it or not, it uses a... Uh, a ball bearing with them spaced, but it's caged so that they don't go flying all over the place. So it's it's basically a wide spaced um, ball bearing uh, with an upper and lower race, one that's held onto the shaft. So it's not a true Timken. Does anybody know where we use Timken uh, uh, bearings? Wheel bearings? Wheel bearings in automotive and trailer <coughs> applications. Harley Davidson from the beginning of time until 1999 also used it on the left side of their crankshaft, on the PTO side. In 2000, Harley-Davidson went to a roller bearing design and there's so many uh, high-end Harley engine builders that they actually made kits to get rid of this and switch it back to a Timken bearing. The one thing that's really nice about a Timken bearing is Timken bearings are adjustable, meaning that we can put spacers in there, how much applied torque we have to to basically set the bearing where we want because bearings when they get hot what do they do expand. they expand so real like heavy heavy duty engine builders really like a Timken bearing versus a roller bearing um, I did not do a conversion kit in my 107 I love it it's going great I got just a standard roller bearing in that um, the uh, Harley Davidson until 1999 also used tapered Timken bearings in all their wheels. Beginning of time, it's a much more complicated process. If you guys watch, uh, um, I don't even think it's on our YouTube channel. I, I did a, a deal for a, a, a TV show one time where they came in and videotaped the lesson, and uh, I did it on Timken tapered wheel bearings. And uh, so Harley's, it takes a bunch of measurement, and you got to do all this stuff. Well, 1970 Hondas always had two ball bearings just like this and there's no adjustment. You put them in, you set your center spacer in between and you're done. There's literally no adjustment whatsoever. Harley-Davidson in 2000 switched their entire motorcycle line to uh, ball bearing style wheel bearings and got away from the Timken bearings. A lot less maintenance, really long life, uh, and super easy for the technicians to change them out. It takes very, very little skill set to change um, a wheel bearing compared to a Timken. Are those pressed on? Yep, and they're all pressed in. Every wheel in the world will have a pressed bearing. Uh, they aren't pressed on the shaft, 
but they're so that you can pull the axle out and easy, but uh, they will always be pressed into the hub of the wheel. Right. Uh, gold wings, for example, get a bad rap, and this is funny because uh, uh, especially like the GL 1100 and 1200 gold wings, they get 100, 150,000 miles out of the rear wheel bearing and then it starts to get loose in the wheel. And Goldwing guys would complain, like, oh, that's junk. That's probably like, you got 150,000 miles on it. So the problem is, though, you can't go to a junkyard and get a wheel because what's probably the condition of that wheel? Same right. as it is. It's right. probably the same. So uh, it gets to be a, a problem that uh, it's such a small bearing for the amount of weight that's put on it, it ends up getting loose in the hub. So what the guys end up doing is taking the bearing, uh, putting it in the hub, green lock tightening it. And then do you remember that technique I call, I talked to you guys about what's called peening? where you take the metal and you, so say this is in a housing, and if I hit it with a punch here, it's gonna push the metal of the housing over. So they'll put those punch marks all the way around the bearing called peening, and between that and the green Loctite, it'll hold the bearing in place. No customer probably wants to ever uh, know that that's the process for their wheel bearing, you know. But. So there, how about that's a good start for bearings? So I really want you to focus on, you know, there's going to be the four types of bearings that we're going to really talk about, and three of them are here. And I want to talk about oil seals. So oil seals, and I'm calling it oil. Um, we have multiple different kinds here. And what our, our big focus here is to, um, wait till you see this video I have that I found last night. I really was struggling to, to find a good video about oil seals and, and what they're actually doing. But most people don't know... Because of this rubber coating, a lot of people think that the oil seal is made of rubber, and it's not. The rubber is made of some type of steel housing, and we're going to have this rubber lip that um, drags across the shaft. Okay, So if these two were part of the same one here, this rubber seal is what's going to drag on the shaft. Now, the reason that's really important is that... You guys are going to learn, and you're going to see this on your two-strokes today, that when a, when a motor is put into use long enough you actually get a witness mark of where the seal rode because it's sitting there dragging on there all the time. And what will cause an actual groove is dirt. And can anybody think about on a dirt bike, there's one place that will end up that you'll, you'll keep putting a new seal in and it'll still leak over time. Anybody have an idea which seal that is on this engine? That would be the sprocket gear. What'd you say? Sprocket gear shaft. Michael, you're right on track here. I mean, Check you. He's right on track. So this oil seal behind the sprocket, all the mud and dirt of the drive chain gets in there. And then this, this rubber seal is, is trying to keep that dirt out. But what happens is it packs right along there. So as the dirt and, and debris and stuff, and sand especially, is trying very hard to work its way in, it will literally dig a groove onto the shaft. Well, when you put the new oil seal in, though it's still sized to stock in that groove, it's going to be a problem. So anybody want to know a trick to, to get away from that? Because your choice is, is to put a whole new shaft in. That would make it back to perfect. But a lot of times our customer, he comes in and says, hey, when I got the bike on the side stand or whatnot, I'm leaking oil out of the seal. Put that seal in. You take the seal off. You see that there's a groove on the shaft. You're like, that new seal is not going to fix a dang thing, is it? Get a smaller you seal. Can't. You can't buy different size seals, unfortunately, in these JB metric weld. applications. That could be a possibility. Could JB weld the shaft up and polish it back down? What we'll do sometimes, check this out, is we'll move the location of the seal just a, like a millimeter. Do you get what I'm saying? So if I have this groove in here and I've got a little room in or out, I can install the seal possibly a little deeper. Okay, and now I'll be riding on a new part of the shaft. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that I'm talking about are the tricks and the tips and whatnot. Now, if I want to move this seal in closer, what I might have to do is grind the back side of this down to make it a little thinner. Does that make sense? Yep. Because what happens is all of these seals are sitting right next to a bearing. And if I think, well, I could just put this in as deep as I want, and I take this metal bearing and set it up against this metal housing and, and actually hit the bearing, I'm going to have a problem. Because all this stuff it needs to be able to grow too, and I definitely don't want to get down into the cage. Okay? All right. So back to the, back to the seal itself. Steel housing. 
a rubber uh, a rubber body or excuse me a rubber uh, viton nitrile there's different materials for this and then what is the function of the spring then to put pressure on the ceiling yeah so this spring is what's going to actually hold tension to the shaft if there is one dent or one ding or anything in there that's going to allow this to have a place that's going to sit you know weird or oblong on the shaft and then we're going to leak Okay, so absolutely cannot go without the spring. If you damage or hit it, you're going to have a problem. Okay, so let's, let's think about installation methods here. On these seals, you can imagine that I usually am I'm going around a shaft, so I need some really large socket. Sometimes what we do is we, people want to, look, look, I'm just for purposes here, let's say I'm installing this seal. They'll take a punch and they want to go here like this. And do you see how that's going to cause it to kind of cock and walk around? I've done that sometimes because it's the only method possible because maybe I'm going across a long shaft or something. But ideally what we want is we want a piece of pipe or uh, you'll see our specialty installation tools. If I can put this seal in without the shaft in the case, that's the most ideal situation because you'll see we have a bearing and seal installer that uh, sets this perfectly flat. Okay. The other thing that you guys are going to notice is that most all seals, when they're installed, this is flush with the case that it's, that it's pressed into. Most. There are some wheels uh, that this is actually recessed in, and the service manual will tell you to take your mic and set it at a depth so that you install it at the right depth. Okay, Just some different tips there. Uh, bearings themselves always get fully seated. You never have one kind of floating around in a case that goes all the way in until it's at the bottom. And then the other thing that we're going to learn today, we're going to learn a couple different methods, how to move them, how to install them, how to inspect them, uh, and then uh, how to, like I said, determine whether, uh, you know, physical damage is easy enough. Like on this one, you can see we're missing a ball and the cage exploded. This was out of a moped, believe it or not. This is out of a little 50cc Zuma, and uh, the back wheel locked up. And uh, when I pulled it apart, this is what I found. The bearing was actually seized to the shaft, um, and there was some chip damage on the transmission shaft here. But uh, really, the problem was is that the bearing exploded. So that's easy. I know that bearing's bad. But when I look at this one here, there's no visible damage. So as I start to roll it, I can feel some grinding or catching in there. That just might be dirty. You know, look look how dirty this bench, you know, uh, where it was stored, the box it was stored in, maybe just a little piece of dirt got in there. So before I determine that a bearing is bad, I want to clean it. I want to clean it with some solvent. Uh, and you, every bearing manufacturer out there says, don't do this. Never spin a bearing. Why? There's no oil. There's no lubrication on it, so you're doing it dry. So what I do is I will spray like a, a JB80 in here. I'll demonstrate this later today. I'll spray the oil in here and then spin it and try and see if I have any catches. But what you don't want to do is take out a parts washer, blow dry it completely dry clean, and now have all metal-to-metal -metal contact, okay? You want that lubrication in there. Um, typically what I'll do is take a bearing and hold it tight and what I'm really looking for is any up and down movement in a bad bearing You'll be able to see that this side to side movement Okay, that's that's okay because it's the 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 races here now a brand new bearing is going to feel really super tight But it's really the the up and down Movement here if I could feel that I got to think about the load because we're you know If this were really excessive and falling all over the place. I wouldn't be able to do the up and down either does that make sense? So that's a, that's a way we're going to inspect it. On other types of bearings, like the tapered bearings, we're going to look at the races. So like this one, um, this one actually isn't looking too bad. Oh, no, if I look really close, can you see those uh, lines in there, those stripes? Those are witness marks from the rollers. The rollers of these that were uh, basically made a, a witness mark on there over time. So if you can fill them with your fingernail, they're definitely, they're definitely no good. Any questions so far on installing of these seals? Would you agree with me that we definitely don't want to be anywhere near the, the spring or this lip? Yep. So I have to be able to have a willingness to look at the inside and then as I flip it, I know how much room I have or what type of sockets I could use to knock this in place from the outside. Another thing about these seals is notice all of them have a lead in. 
So they're meant to set in your hole and by hand, you should be able to start the seal. And what happens with a lot of people is they just take the seal and they, they set it on here and then they just start getting their socket out. That's the second step. What you want to do is set the seal on the hole and push it with your thumbs like this and get it started and then go to a driving method. Okay. Uh, on fork seals, you guys will learn this in suspension classes, we have very little room to work with. So it's a very intentional tool. You get the punches out, you're going to hit the chrome shaft, you have a problem. You really need fork seal drivers. And I just have this in here because I want to show how close and how little room you have for air on fork seals. They're easy to do though. I mean with the right tool, they're, they're easy enough to do.